good evening everyone this is dr krishna chaitanya so today we will discuss about the uh, part 2 which we mentioned previously like approach to pediatric cardiac emergencies so this is the part 2 session which we are going to discuss because previously we had discussed in part 1 about rhythms congenital heart diseases and all so in this session we are going to discuss uh, topics like cyanotic spells and post transplant emergencies and uh, we will discuss about like bridge therapy sort like ecmo lvap and pulmonary hypertension and infective endocarditis or myocarditis then kawasaki disease how it presents in emergency situations and uh, acute chest pain in pediatrics and what are the like syn synco how they present and all so we will try to cover these topics in this uh, session so initially we come to cyanotic spell a hypersyanotic spell yes cyanotic spell is uh, like a where child turns into completely bluish in color uh, and becomes uh, desaturated uh, eventually by due to and this all cycle happens because primarily because in a cyanotic spell what is the main pathophysiology is there is completely shut down of pulmonary blood flow because severe reduction in pulmonary blood flow that will last from last from several minutes to hours with a multitude of consequences here what all can happen definitely even death can happen like if the cyanotic spell doesn't revert back and there is complete severe spasm or complete obstruction of the pulmonary blood flow child may develop into go into complete hypoxia or severe metabolic acidosis goes less than uh, 6.1 ph and eventually death may ensue so usually sometimes if it last uh, if uh, it is a cycle actually uh, cyanotic uh, whenever cyanotic spell happens the cycle keeps on going at some point we have to break that cycle sometimes naturally spontaneously it may even regress so the common physiological one which uh, lands up the cyanotic spell component is usually a large uh, unrestricted uh, ventricular septal defect present which results in equalization of the pressures in both the ventricles yes exactly so what is the most common pathophysiology found in most of the congenital heart defects which present as cyanotic spell is a large vsd so what happens because of the large vsd uh, there will be like bidirectional flow usually so but when the pressures because of the bidirectional flow the pressures in the both ventricles becomes equal so once your right ventricle pressure reaches almost like of the left ventricle pressure and because of that severe pulmonary hypertension may ensue the and because of that uh, severe pulmonary hypertension or complete obstruction of that flow and uh, pressure build up in developing in the right ventricle blood may flow in the unidirectional from right to left and that's where your complete uh, uh, desaturated blood uh, goes through the vsd into the left side of the circulation and child becomes completely severely cyanotic and all metabolic acidosis ensues and uh, there is completely absence of uh, pulmonary blood flow because uh, nothing is going through rvot and uh, because of that there is no oxygenation process hyper uh, yeah we see hypernia hypernia is defined as rapid and deep breathing which is the hallmark of hypersyanotic spells yes so during a cyanotic spell the ejection systolic murmur decreases in intensity yeah this is what uh, we were discussing because uh, the main pathophysiology of uh, cyanotic spell is completely absence of the pulmonary blood flow so usually the ejection systolic murmur which occurs in the vsd is not due to the flow through the vsd but uh, it is due to the flow which is being going through that uh, rvot tract so once that blood flow through the rvot stops there won't be any ejection systolic murmur so sometimes you may uh, feel that completely absent murmur only s1 s2 is heard so before a child who is having murmur and now presenting in cyanotic spell usually the murmur may not be appreciable so cyanotic spells usually self limiting last about some 15 minutes to 30 minutes and uh, when the infants may be lethargic or somnolent and most of them because sometimes they may become unconscious sometimes they may become uh, unresponsive so prolonged hypersyanotic spells uh, that are not treated can lead to hypoxic neurological injuries seizures cerebrovascular accidents and deaths so like what we discuss uh, bunks uh, usually uh, because uh, the completely desaturated blood through the left ventricle goes to the brain and the brain may get a hypoxia hypoxic injury child this cyanotic spell may turn into seizure and from the seizure the child may go into uh, consequences like death so what are the three initial managements you have to take up the infant always uh, first thing position 
keep him in the knee chest position so even if it is an infant just make him a knee chest position to sit or hold them hold the uh, hold them in the in the knee chest position in the mother's lap so just flex the lower legs and uh, onto the abdomen and flex the upper limbs and all make him to chest so what happens with this knee chest position nothing just you are increasing the after load so you are trying to increase the left ventricular after load so that you have to increase the left ventricular pressure because of which your right to left shunting decreases because once your left ventricular pressure develops more because of that increase in after load you are shunting from the right to left decreases and again shunts back left to right and the synotic spell gets broken and that's it that is the normal physiology which the child accustoms naturally even without training most of the time so uh, somebody some 10 years kid or 8 years kid he himself knows while he is running suddenly he develops dyspnea and he just squats he sits himself into that knee chest position nobody trains him he learns it out of his own uh, natural physiological drive that's the uh, nature's uh, thing how he has to make up life so the most common initial first remedy for the treatment in synotic spell is always knee chest position then oxygen always oxygen because uh, he is completely getting desaturated complete left side circulation in the throughout the body is getting desaturated blood so give 100% oxygen always then intravenous fluid boluses because he is completely getting dehydrated and uh, most of the time this hypersynotic spell gets uh, triggered because of his uh, any acute uh, situations so always uh, give fluid boluses then what all you can give intramuscular or subcutaneous morphine then phenylephrine infusion 5 mg per kg per minute if not decreasing go for esmolol infusions 100 mg per kg per minute even if not responding ventilate child get a uh, intubate and ventilate because uh, you can't take the risk of uh, injury to the life uh, then go for urgent emergency vt shunt placement surgical intervention then differential diagnosis of congenital heart diseases so based on the cyanosis like what we discussed so cyanotic patients with increased pulmonary blood flow or cyanotic patients with increased pulmonary blood flow so what are the cyanotic conditions which have increasing pulmonary blood flow so there is increased pulmonary blood flow but there is mixing hence there is cyanosis so it is trunchus arteriosus total anomalous pulmonary venous return and transposition of great arteries so these are the major anomalies where uh, there is mixing and associated with pulmonary increased vascularity so all these three conditions will have pulmonary hypertension and what are the asynotic patients with increased pulmonary blood flow yeah they are vsd asd pda these are the three shunts usually they are not cyanosis to cyanosis from day to day they, but they can launch cyanotic spells in particular whenever there is right to left shunting then cyanotic patients uh, with decreased pulmonary blood flow yeah even these patients with decreased pulmonary blood flow also can Uh, launch a cyanotic spell because decreased pulmonary blood flow even a common illness viral illness or some dehydration may land, land up these uh, children into uh, cyanotic spells and uh, particularly tetralogy of fallot tricuspid anomaly a tricuspid atresia epstein's anomaly and what are the cyanotic patients with normal this is these are like completely other than uh, out of the heart maybe or some left side uh, lesions coaction of aorta aortic stenosis or even pulmonary stenosis then we come we deal with the other type of emergency so, so we are done with cyanotic spell and basic how, basic line management how we do so we are a basic thing i want to tell we are not dealing with each and every emergency in detail the main purpose of uh, this presentation is to give a broad spectrum of what are the various diffuse modalities of emergencies which can be presented and what is the line of treatment what we follow in so we will be very brief regarding it. so post transplant emergencies first most common acute rejection so how do you treat it how do you know that acute rejection very simple uh, you get to know that uh, the heart is failing decrease ejection fraction and uh, ecg changes st elevations and all uh, and uh, so and also you get high cardiac enzyme uh, nt pro bnp markers uh, very high and inflammatory markers going very high child uh, then uh, treatment is with acute rejection treatment always you have to go with steroids or anti thymocyte uh, gamma globulins at gamma uh, which one and uh, next most common infection post transplantation is always because they are immunosuppressed they are so uh, high risk of infections so usually they have to be treated with broad spectrum antibiotics then then comes our next part uh, where we deal mechanical circulatory support so what is mechanical circulatory support so mechanical circulatory support is when like how you do for respiratory support mechanical ventilation so when somebody child unable to breathe having some issue with uh, oxygenation lungs are bad pneumonia or ards 
the way how you are supporting with the mechanical ventilation the same way when your heart is weak some myocarditis or kawasaki severe kawasaki shock or child heart some congenital heart cardiac disease post operative uh, heart is unable to come out of that injury myocardium vulnerable myocardium failing heart uh, so that's where uh, or some cardiomyopathy congenital so that's where you have to uh, go for mechanically even supporting that heart so usually they are used as a bridge to heart transplant or a bridge to recovery or a bridge to take some decision what to go in the future because if you are not going to bridge the cardiac uh, uh, activity is going to arrest the child is going to die so you have you have to bridge it to take up some decision or give time that heart to recovery or get a transplant or something so in general like uh, they are long term support systems or short term support systems so in short term support system the most common one is ecmo so extra corporeal membrane oxygenator with pump system so short term mechanical support with ecmo is used in acute treatment cardiogenic shock or ventricular dysfunction after cardiac surgery so that with expectation the patient will be recovered over a period of time maybe 48 hours or 72 hours or maybe even 4 or 5 days it may run so it usually acts as a bridge so that that whatever post operative heart or some viral infection cardiogenic shock myocarditis it may recover during that time your ecmo support will maintain your complete systemic circulation and vital organ perfusion so how the ecmo circuit works out and this is the ecmo machine how it appears like so this is a machine uh, where you get readings and this is the knob which are rotations per minute which you can adjust so you can do the display of the flow uh, liters per minute will be uh, displayed here and uh, the below column uh, machine is like a temperature uh, uh, thermostat like uh, which maintains the temperature we can set the temperature where you get like temperature humidifier in the mechanical uh, ventilator this acts as a same it acts as a temperature regulator for the ecmo circuit and uh, you can see that there is a inflow system there is an outflow system and this is a uh, oxygenator device uh, this is a uh, pump circulatory pump and uh, oxygenator device so it it functions on the centrifugal force where so the pump will be making its rotation on the complete centrifugal force where the inflow pump is completely extracted um, gone made rotated through that and uh, through that membrane oxygenator blood flows so it provides uh, 100% oxygen you can titrate the fio2 you can uh, ranging from 40 60 you can titrate the fio2 whatever oxygenation you can give and the oxygenated blood uh, goes through that uh, centrifugal force pump and it uh, pumps the blood again back into the external kit so this is the uh, original device and this is the uh, flow diagram where this is a membrane oxygenator from then it goes to or directly into the aorta and this is the cannula in the superior uh, vena cava and right atrium from here it is going into that pump where that pump works on the centrifugal force and this pump uh, so pump blends uh, into the membrane oxygenator so like circuit keeps on growing then so this ecmo device is usually a short term uh, mechanical support whereas long term mechanical supports what we have as vad so ventricular assist devices so vads are typically employed for long term supports where cardiac dysfunction and where you are uh, uh, anticipating a cardiac transplant maybe next month uh, registry uh, donor has yet to come or some cadaveric uh, transplant you want to uh, make or some brain dead somebody cadaveric means some brain dead not cadaver uh, maybe somebody is brain dead and is uh, working heart is uh, uh, extracted and uh, that is being transported uh, through uh, green uh, corridor system and then transplant if you are expecting then that way uh, you some time may take so do you have to bridge this child or else he may die uh, within uh, hours so if you want to bridge that child for at least few months or few days you have to go for uh, ventricular assist devices so prompt defibrillation cardiopulmonary resuscitation and anti arrhythmic therapy if the ventricular attack is refractory should be always employed uh, because uh, these uh, though assist devices uh, they can any time fail so this all needs to be taken care of at every moment then in addition extra corporeal membrane oxygenation resuscitator uh, during resuscitation which is called as ecpr ecmo during cpr should be mobilized if available so this is the most uh, interesting uh, topic which is known as ecpr so cpr everybody know through the pals like if somebody cardiac arrest happens you go for uh, ceab so what is ecpr so whenever you have you are working in an institute where you have cardiac uh, cardiologist backup cardiac thoracic surgeon backup and ecmo circuit unit complete 
backup so somebody cardiac arrest is going on uh, you immediately call for the response of the cardiac team and you start ecpr where you immediately take the child for starting up the ecmo because cardiac arrest to the myocardium is going to be vulnerable for at least for next 48 to 72 hours so you have to give time to recover it so we immediately try to get cannulation central cannulations usually and uh, connect the child to so american heart association pediatric uh, advanced life support guidelines for in hospital cardiac arrest recommends always consideration of the ecpr in children especially with if heart diseases and if the conditions are likely to be reversible or amenable to heart transplant so overall survival to discharge in pediatric ecmo patients is 50% and 41% for ecpr that's very good numbers actually to say so this survival varies with age indication and even cardiac diagnosis so children with myocarditis have the highest survival to discharge uh, of any cardiac ecmo diagnosis especially with a rate of up to 72% just see just imagine if there is no ecmo bridging or there is no ecpr you are going to just uh, do a cpr your child may revive back or may not revive back and in hospital cardiac arrest uh, revival chances are only 20 to 25% and hardly it may go up to 40% but in myocarditis if you have ecmo unit backup and if you do ecpr your survival rates may come up even 70% then lvad left ventricular assist device so left ventricular assist device is a pump connecting the left ventricle to the aorta you can see the picture in the diagram so where you will have a pump device and uh, it may be pulsatile or non pulsatile there are again two types of the devices so one cannula will be in the aorta and one cannula will be in the left ventricle uh, so they could be used as a bridge to transplant where there is not much of hope for recovery and the bridge to recovery cardiac function is likely to recover or a suitable candidate for the heart attack like what we discussed before so they are being the, and one more thing uh, ventricular assist devices are also being used as destination therapies where there is no plan to bridge to transplant so suppose somebody there is no available transplant or they may not be uh, affording to transplant or whatever the reasons but if they are only making up to left ventricular assist device there are trials going on just to use it as a destination therapy even so based on the types of the flow yeah they can be pulse style or continuous so uh, these are all devices predominantly being uh, devised for the adults but for the children only one fda approved device is there berlin heart expert device is definitely there are uh, trials going on to bring up more uh, ventricular assist device and all so iabp intraaortic balloon pump and total heart kitchen arts are also more used in adults uh, we are not uh, familiar to use much of iabp in uh, pediatrics but yes berlin heart expert is so here are the pictorial representations so lvad is left ventricular assist device and the rvad is right ventricular assist device where your cannulas will be in the pulmonary aorta and right ventricle and bivad is bi ventricular assist device where you have the both pumps and total artificial heart where you have the complete uh, uh, total artificial heart you use in situations where the complete uh, because of the heart cardiac is completely damaged or severe dilated cardiomyopathy where it is ejection fractions less than 10% and no transplant options available and long term patients need so you will use both the pumps and just connect them to the Uh, one in the pulmonary artery and one in the aorta and you even venous connections you take so this works as a total artificial heart and these are the first generation and second generation is heart made third generation is like you have but uh, these are all trials are going on in the adults so you can see pictures like they will have a bag uh, the patient he will be even walking uh, if you take a chest x ray you will see the device and uh, if you uh, check for the pulse there will be no pulse it is a non pulse attempt so it will be running through that uh, centrifugal force so iabb and total artificial but these are all predominantly more in adults in pediatric it is only berlin heart expo so that's we are done with that then next our uh, emergency presentations are pulmonary hypertension so how pulmonary hypertension presents as an emergency it is though an uncommon but potentially life threatening condition and uh, it has definitely uh, mortality rate and uh, if we are able to deal with it identify early and intervene timely definitely survival chances are also very good and usually a loud pulmonic component of the second heart sound is an important diagnostic clue in the presence of the pulmonary hypertension because as high diastolic pulmonary pressure will force the pul- uh, will force the pulmonary valve to shut against great intensity yes just like systemic arterial hypertension where you have very high uh, pressures and aorta uh, and left ventricle has to pump against that high pressures the same way when your pulmonary pressures are very high maybe due to reactive primary uh, or secondary uh, you will have a loud p2 component then emergency intervention so what you can do for pulmonary hypertension once you diagnose pulmonary hypertension first always uh, 
keep the child calm keep the child quiet let him not cry let him be comfortable don't touch him much don't try to poke uh, with uh, iv needles and all no much uh, handling give only 100% oxygen if possible sedate the child and suction the airways because even a minute amount of airway blockade or some minimal hypoxia triggers pulmonary hypertension like anything so uh, always sir uh, remove the mucus plugging and keep nasal suction frequently if possible ventilate the child completely sedate and paralyze the child take complete breathing into your control uh, get the pulmonary hypertension settled over next uh, hours or next days of life so and hyperventilation yes definitely hyperventilation washing out of the co2 definitely even uh, breaks down that uh, pulmonary hypertensive crisis situation because uh, as we know oxygen is a potential vaso dilator in pulmonary circulation so the more uh, potential vaso dilator so the more uh, you give that pulmonary hypertension that hypertension whatever that uh, pulmonary pressure which is under tight spasm it relaxes usually whereas systemic it is a uh, vaso constrictor but in pulmonary it is a vaso dilator so the addition of inhaled nitric oxide yeah even nitric oxide is even more potent uh, vaso dilator than oxygen at a doses but yeah straight away go to 20 ppm there is nothing to start at 5 ppm 10 ppm either something like ayurvedic or homeopathic dosage what you use if you want to start nitric oxide for pulmonary hypertension straight away go for 20 ppm and it produces effective pulmonary vasodilation once if you achieve a stage where you control that pulmonary hypertension then you can slowly come down on tapering the nitric oxide uh, ppm and usually it will be after some 12 hours at least so but if you couldn't find the response uh, if your PO2s didn't improve or if your CVP didn't come down or uh, your pulmonary hypertension is still high, you can if you can measure uh, pressures or through echocardiography or invasive things. Uh, but if it's still high and not responding to nitric oxide even after some two to three hours, there is no point in uh, continuing that nitric oxide therapy. Then you have to go for another alternatives. So then we come with the uh, another uh, next uh, model so other than inhaled nitric oxide there are even trials which we are going to use especially in neonates and uh, infants uh, sildenafil infusions and uh, milrinone magnesium sulfate so multiple other drug infusions are being tried as uh, pulmonary vasodilators then young children with left heart obstruction usually present with respiratory or gi simple limiting pneumonia bronchiolitis even asthma like cardiac wheeze they can present then another emergency situation like chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension it is a specific subclass of pulmonary hypertension that represents the cumulative effect of acute pulmonary emboli that have not completely resolved so suppose somebody child may have some uh, uh, hypercoagulability disease and they land up in pulmonary embolization and because of that pulmonary embolization your backward pulmonary hypertension develops and they may develop into thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension phenomenon so for this always a pre-existing hypercoagulable state is most commonly diagnosed so risk factors for ctph are like what we said hypercoagulable state it can be due to thrombophilia or some malignancy or even some sepsis or even pregnancy like in adults and all so this is a virtuous triad what we say like uh, stasis of the flow endothelial injury hypercoagulation like thrombus like what we read in pathology then ctph is one of the few subclass of pulmonary artery hypertension which is potentially curable yes so patients diagnosed with CTEP should be rapidly transferred to the cardiac center and surgical pulmonary thromboendiatrectomy or catheter based removal or lysis of the thrombic material may be needed. Yes, definitely. These are cases need, cannot be managed in normal pediatric centers. They need to be referred to the cardiac centers where they may need uh, emergency surgical or uh, procedure, uh, cath lab procedure to remove thrombectomy procedures. They may be on In acute settings, especially when patients can't as PTE is being given. Heparin is the anticoagulation of the size. Obviously, uh, they have to be started on heparin infusions so that the thrombus or emboli don't uh, get more, increase more and cause complete obstruction. And heparin can be titrated based on the individual's anticoagulation protocols. Uh, like we target range of APTT or PTTK or range up to 60 to 80. Yeah, normal will be up to 30. But uh, in case when you, whenever you are on heparin infusion, you target your 60 to 80 and targeting your 60 to 80 aptt you either increase the dose or decrease the dose with 10 10 percent uh, whenever you repeat that then next comes is the vaso occlusive pains the emergency what they present sickle cell disease children they present to emergency with acute chest pain uh, vaso occlusive disease so they may need opiate analgesics even for relief and hyperhydration start uh, like bolus 20 ml per kg bolus you hyperhydrate 
then we discuss emergency interventions so what are the emergency interventions which can be uh, needed so bas balloon atrial septostomy so when do you need balloon atrial septostomy they usually in cases with dtga where the intact septums are there and there is tga so your pulmonary artery is arising from the left ventricle and your aorta is arising from the right ventricle and suppose if both atrial septum and ventricular septum are intact so it is impossible to live postnatally so definitely the child will collapse within hours so that child may be taken for balloon atrial septostomy before you go for corrective surgery because the moment you make balloon atrial septostomy the left and the right something mixing will happen so that the blood flow goes in series circulation or else what happens if there is intact septum and uh, there is dtga two circulations will be completely parallel and there will be no mixing so there will be no point no oxygenation nothing so you have if you try to make a balloon atrial septostomy there will be you will allow some part of mixing so the, there will be a series connection then pericardiocentesis acute pericardial effusion pericardial tamponade so you have to go for pericardiocentesis immediate decompression or as the child may go for cardiac arrest then balloon valvuloplasty yes this is also an emergency intervention where you go for severe pulmonary stenosis severe aortic stenosis the child presents in completely cyanotic spell or completely severe circulatory failure shock so you have to go for emergency balloon valvuloplasty then another emergency procedure which is upcoming in cardiac centers uh, most recently advanced rvot stenting so yeah definitely an ideally procedurally placed timely placed rvot stenting even can prevent a open heart surgery Uh, especially in cases of like tetralogy of fallot nowadays people are trying to go for rvot stenting in order to avoid complete open heart surgeries so rvot stenting is a stenting device where you deploy a stent in your rvot and it tries to keep it open so there is always a flow from the right ventricle to pulmonary artery then transvenous spacing emergency device whenever you need there suppose a child comes with complete heart block so you have to go for emergency transvenous spacing like a trans uh, you have to uh, put a center line and uh, put a catheter uh, where that goes up to the uh, superior uh, vena cava or uh, uh, junction with uh, right atrium uh, where you will implant an electrode so that's where uh, transvenous spacing and you will connect that uh, wire outside to the external pacer box so this may happen where you will get complete heart block lyme disease lupus disease diphtheria this presents with a complete heart block so that child may need emergency transvenous spacing always then recannulating blocked shunts this may emergency suppose the child may be had performed bt shunt some 3 months back now the child comes with completely again uh, repeated cyanotic spells and all and uh, child is in complete circulatory shock like stage so if you hear there is uh, no flow you could see if you show eco echocardiography the shunt is completely blocked so the child needs emergency recannulating that blocked shunt or else because child may die so these are the emergency interventions which may be needed then avoid beta agonist in bronchiolitis in congenital heart diseases because yeah we discussed this last time also in part 1 tachycardia causes increased myocardial consumption and worsens cardiac function and preferably use high flow nasal oxygen or racemic epinephrine then causes of the cardiogenic shock yeah we discussed it in the last episode also uh, like day one of like usually it is birth asphyxia or tapvc or tga with intact septum uh, or uh, hlhs uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome Uh, with and those with presence in the first uh, week of life are duct dependent systemic circulations or duct dependent pulmonary circulation lesions and uh, next after weeks are like vsd asd and uh, older children it may be due to arrhythmia or kawasaki diseases cardiomyopathy and all then another most common em- emergency which may be presenting is uh, infective endocarditis so life threatening infective endocarditis may see heart, suddenly child may present heart failure severe uh, systemic uh, manifestations and rash over the body and conjunctivitis or even uh, uh, sepsis present high inflammatory markers if you see there are uh, severe uh, vegetations completely sitting on the walls obstructing the blood flows so patients with acute rheumatic fever or mild to moderate cardiac should be treated with high dose aspirin completely it's not like something uh, 3 to 5 mg antiplatelet dose it is actually anti inflammatory dose which you go for even 80 to 100 mg per kg per day which you divide it over uh, 6 hours uh, in children and patients present with severe valvular insufficiency or hemodynamic compromise should be evaluated for urgent surgical interventions definitely if there is a big large chunk infective endocarditis mass or some uh, sitting on that valve and making severe valvular insufficiency and your uh, lv keeps on distending distending it will go into cardiac arrest you have to make the child to uh, urgent intervention to do something 
then kawasaki disease is another emergency which may present with a hemodynamic compromise kawasaki shock which is called as kd shock so the child may be needing inotropic infusions vasoactive infusions uh, so treatment is always uh, try to start uh, aspirin immediately and treat with uh, ivig 2 gram per kg per day uh, 2 gram per kg uh, completely given over uh, 48 hours then initial treatment of myocarditis is uh, aimed at supporting cardiac output and pediatric heart failure guidelines suggest usually milrinone preferably always milrinone or dobutamine as first line agent in for children with decompensated heart failure okay this is most point you see whereas epinephrine is reserved for patients with refractory hypotension and poor end organ perfusion so whenever somebody child who is landing up in heart failure but able to maintain good tissue perfusion with good blood pressure then always your drug of choice will be milrinone or dobutamine whereas if child is already decompensated and is having hypotension and having end organ perfusion uh, impairment then you can't go for using your milrinone or dobutamine then you have to always go up with your epinephrine then digoxin is usually not recommended in this phase because it has increased myocardial injury cases then your next coming uh, emergency which can be presenting is uh, dilated cardiomyopathy in an acute uh, clinical scenario uh usually in pediatrics don't just uh, think of only congenital dilated cardiomyopathy can be even acquired also maybe due to vitamin d deficiency or calcium deficiency uh, so try to treatable causes we should always be trying to rule out and persistent tachycardia in the absence of usual cause and cardiomegaly on chest x ray are pointers of cardiac uh, possible cardiac dysfunction so like if you see an x ray there is cardiomegaly and there is persistent tachycardia or tachycardia in the absence of any known cause so you have no cause you don't know the reason but there is tachycardia and if you take an x-ray there is cardiomegaly definitely you think of oh, there is some cardiac dysfunction then the next uh, emergency we are dealing with uh, stroke definitely cardiogenic stroke here we are not going to discuss about a neurogenic stroke and all uh, our target is cardiogenic stroke yes pediatrics especially uh, stroke uh, and especially here we are discussing we are not discussing about stroke due to any hematological problem or anything here we deal with stroke due to cardiological problem so some congenital heart disease presenting with stroke how it happens always cardiac heart disease stroke there is always right to left shunt because it is unlikely to happen for a stroke or thromboembolic event with left to right shunts uh, stroke has to happen in congenital heart diseases usually synotic or asynotic whenever there is some right to left shunting so from uh, some vegetation or some thrombi from the right side which uh, gets bypassed of the pulmonary circulation where the filtering doesn't happen and straight away it goes through the left side into the aorta lands up in some brain or pulmonary artery uh, or uh, some coronaries or wherever it sits and it causes thromboembolic pneumonia so always in unrepaired diseases endure normothermia endure normoglycemia treat if any seizures and maintain cerebral perfusion then go for ct or mri imaging if you see any brain abscess is yes, definitely some septic foci eco vegetations send a culture first because it may be infective endocarditis causing brain abscess start with a broad spectrum antibiotics then if it is an arterial infarct uh, start up straight away on heparin infusions use anticoagulation infusions for 3 months uh, if not uh, if three if infusion you may run for 2 to 3 days and later convert it into oral usually uh, warfarin oral you give and you send back them home and uh, thrombolysis we are not doing thrombolysis in pediatrics yeah this uh, using of uh, uh, recombinant uh, things uh, thrombolytic enzymes uh, we are not using in still pediatrics it's not recommended yet maybe in near future we may come up with the pediatric recommendations also then cerebral venous infarcts yes hydration more and uh, phlebotomy if you are uh, hb or hematocrit is more than that because always uh, uh, high hematocrit is also a reason for causing stroke so if it is very high definitely you may for phlebotomy and uh, letting out the blood so that uh, targeting your hematocrit at a normal range then uh, next uh, infections which are all possible which can present as emergency with cardiac thing is tetanus we, how how tetanus is going to cause cardiac emergency with the dysautonomia sudden hypertension sudden hypotension child vital hemodynamically completely unstable uh, and uh, with uh, some uh, rhesus sardonicus or uh, uh, tetanic spasms or some coagulatory signs child may be developing Uh, so uh, what you do tetanus antitoxin how much 500 international units and uh, what all you can do for dysautonomia uh, if uh, there is severe hypertensive crisis and all go for labetalol infusions or uh, you can use magnesium sulfate or you can use clonidin uh, then what other infection causes can present with cardiac emergency diphtheria usually how how it causes it causes complete heart block it causes myocarditis 
diphtheric myocarditis really is potentially life threatening it is very lethal it is completely we have seen uh, completely dilated uh, hearts with ejection fraction less than 10% who are going to succumb to death within hours and they are completely acutely bradycardic complete heart block so these children have to be sent for transvenous spacings so immediately you have to give anti diphtheric syrup how much 50000 international units if not available what you do go for ivig then cardiac wise what you can do start upon digoxin or uh, give uh, furosemide start carvedilol infusions this carvedilol though it is not going to act on the day one but it, it acts for the future then uh, we deal with chest pain so contrary to the belief at a large in the community etiology of the chest pain in pediatric patients is mostly non cardiac as usual even in cardiac it is uh, adults also it is non cardiac and even in pediatric it is non cardiac so whoever complaining of the chest pain it is not always cardiac it may be due to pretty respiratory pneumonia or even some gastritis or asthma cough they may just complain of chest pain and uh, one more thing most common uh, cause of the syncope is vasovagal syncope a yes, sudden uh, somebody telling uh, we are falling down just don't confuse between syncopes and seizures so syncope is just loss of consciousness and usually it is most commonly due to vasovagal syncopes and it uh, most commonly is the reason for 40 to 50% of the cases presents into pediatric emergency department with syncopes and patients with vasovagal syncope typically have normal cardiac examination no murmur is heard uh, you do ecg you do x ray you do echo everything is normal and any abnormal finding should prompt for underlying the uh, diagnosis and all you should see so what happens if there is any underlying systolic ejection murmur always think of some hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or aortic stenosis if there is some gallop rhythm think of some myocarditis if the rhythm is irregular just get a 12 lead ecg check whatever the rhythm if you could able to hear some pericardial rubs or some high jvp think of some pericarditis or cardiac tamponade or myocarditis what is going on then ECG may be valuable in identifying these all things. Yes, that's definitely as we discussed. So, if your ECG is showing some left ventricular hypertrophy or united T waves, definitely it is some hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you can think of. Especially when these are all are for ECG when there is syncope. So, how you suspect myocarditis in child with syncope? Yeah, sinus tachycardia, T wave inversions, long QRS voltages in the limb leads. Especially the most characteristic feature is this T wave inversion. Always remember, syncope child, T wave inversion. Think of myocarditis. then pericarditis definitely generalized st elevations so like ischemia how you see ischemia in adults st elevations that way pericarditis is going to present with tachycardia with syncope in your children so these ecg are characteristic findings and very diagnostic so then alcapa anomalous coronary artery origin from deep uh, from pulmonary artery so how it presents with your ecg deep and wide q waves in the lead 1 and avl and t wave inversions and st elevations in precordial leads so this is also characteristic ecg appearance you see q waves in lead 1 and avl and t wave inversions in inferior lateral leads and st elevation in precordial leads so these three are characteristic features of alcapa alcapa is again like myocardial ischemia because you see when your coronary artery is arising from the pulmonary artery which is completely desaturated blood ultimately it is going to cause myocardial ischemia then arrhythmias so arrhythmias presenting usually in pediatrics are like uh, with cardiac emergencies like we discussed with previous last time only like narrow complex uh, tachycardia wide complex tachycardia long qt svt brugada and uh, fibrillations and all we uh, in the part 1 we discussed in clear and uh, upcoming topic we will be more discussing in clear about approach to wide complex tachycardia in pediatrics we will deal in detail about that in the, our next session then pulmonary embolism as we already discussed even ecg you can get uh, like rv strain pattern then uh, like final we will just make up the ch uh, child with approach uh, to evaluation in a pediatric child with a murmur so appearance of the child so whenever it's not like just you hear the murmur uh, it's not my part i am sending the child to the cardiologist no don't think like that as a pediatrician or as a practicing pediatrician or even post graduate or even whatever so you should know the approach so it's not just a murmur you auscultate and you think you have done something you have to just classify the child into whatever you like to know so appearance just look at the appearance of the child If the child is well appearing then what you see it is a systolic murmur then likely it is a still murmur because even anemia or some flow murmur also can be there so just cardiology consult if the nature of the murmur changes are persist or else you need not send him to cardiologist then if it is well appearing child but the murmur is very definitely short systolic and radiate into axilla and radiate into back then definitely think of some peripheral pulmonary stenosis and consult cardiologist if this is persisting beyond one year of life then if the child is ill appearing sick looking failure to thrive 
completely sweating mother complaints of uh, intermittent child turning into blue in color or whatever then definitely he is a ill looking child then you classify the murmur it is a holosystolic or diastolic murmur you have to differentiate how you differentiate check the murmur along with central pulse or peripheral pulse and see whether your murmur is arising along with the systole or along with the diastole then if it is a holosystolic or diastolic or continuous murmur think of vsd or pda then urgent cardiologist consultation you take uh, get a 2d echo and send to cardiologist if it is a new onset holosystolic or diastolic murmur associated with fever take cardiologist opinion get a echogram to rule out infective endocarditis why here fever is there okay whenever you are hearing a new onset in a completely normal child but now presenting with murmur associated with fever yes think of infective endocarditis okay so this is the reference uh, what we take for the entire presentation a practical approach to diagnosis and management of cardiac emergency in children by ashok uh, sarnayak and robert so steve uh, lustig so published through springer so guys hope oh, everyone uh, understood the basic uh, um, in these two parts we try to discuss the what are all the various different types of the cardiac emergencies and uh, how to deal with them in the just like basic level what is the approach we do and how cardiac emergencies are different from non cardiac pediatric emergencies so hope everybody had understood and had a basic idea how to differentiate and how to follow like a algorithmic or uh, wise if you still have any doubts do uh, mail me back or uh, message me back so we will come up with a uh, next session with uh, approach to wide complex tachycardia and uh, we will deal it in the next so thank you see you soon